Greetings, book lovers everywhere. I'm E Train, and welcome back to E Train Talks. I'm E Train, an 11 year old avid reader, literacy advocate, interviewer, podcast host. And I've got to say, every day is an adventure on E Train Talks, and today is no different because today I get the chance to sit down virtually and chat with the multi talented, award winning Canadian author and filmmaker Hart Snyder. Hart is a director, writer, and story editor who's edited films and series for CBC, NFB, Paramount Television, National Geographic, Global, History, Food Network, which my dad loves to watch, NBA Canada, and more. And yes, on top of all this, he's a published author. Whoa. And Hart's been honored by the government of Alberta, Canada, and and he's the winner of the most of most inspirational short film. And recognized for many of his incredible film and writing projects by a lot of people. It's not hard to tell that Hart must have a pretty amazing and inspiring and just downright interesting writing journey and film journey to share with us today. But first and foremost, let's just all give a warm welcome to Hart Snyder. Because here at E-Train Talks, we love to give warm welcomes. Round of applause. Wow, man. Thanks. That was a great intro. You're a good researcher. That was like heavy duty. Um, uh, good look into the past. So that's exciting. Um, I love Food Network too. Um, and yeah, it's great to be here and talk about the book. So thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited you're here as well. And we're going to be taking a little bit of a dive into the past. And mostly we're talking about the present the basketball game your newest novel which is in the past but i don't think that counts um so one of the main reasons i've been looking forward to talking to heart is because not only am i very curious to learn more about heart's new novel which just came out last month the basketball game which in case you haven't heard of it it's an autobiography told from the perspective of a nine-year-old boy who just so happens to be heart's younger self heart's the protagonist and it's an incredible true story full of heart both Hart Snyder and Hart. It's written as a graphic novel for upper middle schoolers, and it touches upon serious themes like racism, anti-Semitism, and hate. But the basketball game also shows us understanding, acceptance, and hope. As many of you listening probably know, topics dealing with combating anti-Semitism and racism are really important issues for me as a Jew, and also as just someone who, like, wants to make a difference and wants to make everyone welcome in this world. So anyway, I'm just really happy to be talking to Hart, and I'm just so happy that he wrote the basketball game because it shines a light on important topics, and it's just also a really interesting read in general. Like I had no idea about any of the events that happened in the basketball game, but now I'm educated and I want to learn more. And that's why Hart Snyder is here today to teach me and all of you. So the first question is, before we get into the story behind your novel, will you share a bit about your writing history? Did you like to write as a kid? And if you didn't, like, what age did you really start writing? Um, wow. Well, thanks again uh, for all the nice things. I should I should have a show like this more often. Um, it's exciting to uh, share this story, especially as a book, because, yeah, it originally started as a film. Um, and so it's a story I've been telling for a long time. Um, and I, it, it's exciting as a book because it's finally got the kind of the whole story and any questions that people had from the film, I got to think about how to include um, everything into into there. Um, I love and I always have loved comics. And that was my entry point into reading. I taught myself to read with uh, the, or like it was like the secret origins of all the Justice League mini comics that I got given at some point when I was really young and obsessively looked at them until that was how I learned how to read. Um, and so I've always loved comics and thought about the writers of comics and how much fun they must have. So it's always kind of been a dream of mine uh, going way, way back to uh, eventually write a, a graphic novel or a comic. Um, and, uh, but it crazy path, like not a straight line for me to be type of story. Um, with writing, it was always actually really tough for me and I wouldn't, I never did very well in school. Eventually, years later, I 
found out that I have learning disabilities in reading, writing, and math, which uh, was probably the hardest one in school. But me eventually becoming a writer is also kind of a long, uh, like, uh, not the journey you would expect. Um, and weirdly, it was once I started using computers as a way to not only like people always had trouble reading my writing and when they could see it on a screen or print it out, it became much easier. And I also learned to cut and paste my ideas and be able to tell the story I wanted um, in a way that wasn't crossing stuff out and drawing arrows and erasing and white out and all this stuff that I found frustrating and I would usually just give up. Um, and um, so my writing journey really took off once I had a way to to kind of work with my ideas and um, I studied it in university I took creative writing and started writing short stories I've always been interested in autobiographical stories and um, uh, I've always been drawn to graphic novels that are uh, someone's personal story what they call graphic memoir um, and it's reading comics what I didn't know was also teaching me the language of film and of cinema and of TV because it's really the exact same thing. It's a storyboard of like, how do I put pictures in order to help tell a story? And so um, I, as much as I was driven to writing, I was also got really interested in film and kind of had uh, a whole career working in film and making films. And the fact that this story led to me adapting it into a book really kind of brought everything full circle for me. Well, I've never really thought of comics as storyboards for movies, but now that I think about it, that's... They really are. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why there's so many adaptations, because you can kind of see proof that, like, oh, I feel like I'm in this world, and the characters look like this, and and um, it's a totally different style than um, just having, you know, descriptions. You can really see the flow and the pace and and um you can make it exciting in different ways different tools to use but it lends itself really well but the thing is and this is very me uh i did it backwards everybody else goes from a graphic novel to a film and i took a film and made it into a graphic novel i feel like that might be a little bit easier like so i, I would want to go that path as well like also because i feel like um, whilst comics are storyboards for films, I feel like a film could also be a storyboard for a comic. So, yeah, well, this one did, and it was a way to give, um, like word balloons and the, the narrator, like, you had so many more options and then in telling a film where I was the only voice of, uh, in this film. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, anyone could talk, which is very exciting. I mentioned some of the important themes included in the basketball game, but would you share a bit more about the true story behind what inspired the book? It is a graphic memoir after all, and the story itself is yeah. just so, wow. I want to hear it from your perspective. So what happened and just what's the basketball game about at all? Okay, well, it goes back to uh, the year 1983, and I was nine years old and going to... Uh, camp for the first time. In my case, it was a Jewish summer camp. Um, we went for three weeks. There were two different sessions. And it was like this big place in the community. The Edmonton Jewish community was pretty small. There was also Calgary is a nearby city. And um, people came from different places in Western Canada too, from Saskatchewan um, to the camp. And it was this uh, kind of like rite of passage, like finally I'm old enough that I get to go. And uh, I was excited about it beforehand and, and it definitely uh, made a huge impression on me and I kept going there for years. Uh, even my parents went to this camp. Um, the year that I went was uh, uh, a time in Alberta's history um, where unfortunately there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the news and um, there were a few events that happened and then the story came out about a teacher in Eckville, Alberta, who uh, he was a social studies teacher. He was also the mayor of the town of Eckville. 
and um, it, it, he'd been fired and, and it came out that he'd been in his classes teaching anti-Semitic conspiracy theories instead of the regular social studies stuff that one might learn in school. Um, instead of teaching about uh, the Holocaust, he taught Holocaust denial. Um, and he not only uh, was found out that he was doing this, it, it had been going on, I think it was for 11 years by the time um, it finally came to a head and he was fired. So uh, there was a, a lot of headlines about it and about how this could have happened. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, fear and worry and you can imagine a whole range of emotions in the Jewish community about like, yeah. how do we deal with this? This is crazy. Uh, a lot of different opinions and people from all across Canada being interested and, and the world um, finding out about the story. And it was this embarrassment. It was, um, you know, it was a terrible thing to have happened. And the community wondered what to do. And they um, gave a lot of interviews. There was a lot of um, public discussion and it eventually led to a trial and eventually led to a, um, Keekstra, that just the, I'll end his story, which was he was convicted of spreading hate of um, against Jewish people. And it was the first time that Canada's laws about hate had ever had like been tested by his going to court. So it became an important thing in Canada, his story. But outside of all the media attention and uh, this being eventually becoming part of Canadian history, off to the side, the camp director got together with some of the parents in Eckville and the principal and the Jewish community in Edmonton and Calgary, and they started talking about how, what can we do to make this better? The people in Vancouver brought, brought the kids to a... Um, a conference about the Holocaust. They tried to t teach them the reality of the truth of what happened and, and how they had unfortunately been taught so many lies in school. And the um, at camp, they brought, they decided, let's bring anyone that from Eckville High to Camp BB, and we will have outside of any uh, cameras or anything, we'll have a day of fun and fellowship, they called it. And it was a picnic and some events and a basketball game. And so very long answer to say I was nine and that my first summer at camp and I ended up playing in this basketball game. Now, were you good? <laughs> I was not that good at basketball. No, I was wondering if this would ever come up. Yeah, not, not a natural. Uh, it's funny, my memories of the whole thing, because it's like I'm not a, a natural basketball player. But I do remember taking part in this sport, this uh, event. Yeah. So I like soccer. Yeah. Wow. That is, that that's just such a, I can't imagine the emotions that went through all of your heads. Like these kids were taught lies about you. And yeah. in one of the scenes in the book, um, one of the kids asked, so do you have horns to you? Yeah. And that I just can't imagine like how you must have felt like these kids who had been taught to basically hate Jews. They'd been taught lies. They their whole lives um since they since they had that teacher they thought that you that we were just yeah. People. We were it's liars. really tough, yeah. I can't um, imagine how you must have felt. That's just like I, I'm at a loss for words. You're, and I'm gonna say it again, everybody. You need to read the basketball game to find out a little bit more about the story and see it in like through the eyes of nine-year-old Hart Snyder. He doesn't really look like not like nine right now, but he was nine in the book. <laughs> it was forty years ago. Yeah, yeah um, almost. The um, I think. I mean, that was a, a crazy situation, but the the overall um, thing that came out of the event wasn't that we were just exposed to, um, you know, terrible remarks. 
um, it was being together, I yeah. think, was a way to diffuse all the tension and all the ideas and all the stuff you'd been taught and the stereotypes and realize that it wasn't just them, that we had our own stereotypes of who they were um, and from what they'd been taught. And my friend, um, I remember him saying it to me back then, but uh, even as adults, I talked to him about it and he had the exact same thing to say. Um, my friend Danny, who said, you know, it's not their fault that they were taught these things. And it, until they had a chance to actually interact on a just person to person level, it's like, how can you break free of the, all this stuff that all these ideas maybe that you've been taught or that you're gonna see online or, um, you know, so many different ways that, that people unfortunately might see um, racist ideas or anti-Semitic ideas. Definitely. So, hopefully um talking about it is a way past it or through it yeah conversations are so important and speaking of conversations um so in one of the beginning scenes of your book the, it says like the only reason you joined the basketball game was because a pretty girl asked you did that actually happen was that actually like, well i would say with a lot of the story there's there's like these moments because i was nine and this was a long yeah. time ago that's true. So there's things that I like clearly have never forgotten. And like the moment when they come in on the school bus and step off and it was like, oh my God, it's them. Like this, like I'll never forget that moment. And the interaction I had on the basketball court before the game, I'll never forget it. And I'll also never forget by the end of the game, feeling like I was playing basketball and I was more worried, you know, of being in position and making a pass and and playing defense and we were just interacting like regular people and so those things are all in the story but I also had to you know put it together as a story so everyone uh needs a real characters always need a motivation and a reason yeah, to do things true. and so I me at nine I was trying to think what what are ways that I would have signed up for a thing like this because it's just yeah it's not uh if I'd known the full extent of it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I wanted that that idea to be in the story. Well, I'm really glad that you added that idea. And I'm just so I I honestly I kind of I believed that that was what happened. So like it does sound something well, like a nine year old would do. Yeah. yeah. Um the uh Galit who's in the story is based on my wife so we didn't wow. actually go to camp together but at her camp she was really good at making friendship bracelets and that was like her thing that she was known for so I kind of put her into the story too even though she wasn't there and as I said before the basketball game deals with important and sensitive themes of anti-semitism hate fear and prejudice and as a Jew myself I'm just so glad that you wrote the basketball game but I just can't imagine what it must have been like to come face to face with kids that were brainwashed and taught to hate and fear you just because of your ethnicity, just because you were Jewish. So your story shares events that took place, as well as what you were feeling during the events that happened back in camp when you were nine years old. So what happened next? After you went to the camp, what happened after that? Did you... Like become friends with any of the kids? Did you continue to experience anti-Semitism? Were the events still going on in Alberta? Um, these are all good questions. I um I don't know where to start. Well, in Alberta, I would say things in the 80s and even in the 90s, there were a lot of flare-ups. Um, and to this day, where you'll hear about an incident, um, graffiti or I'm sure a lot of incidents, incidents that don't go reported. Um, so it's never, unfortunately, something that goes away. That's true. Um, and yeah, so there were other other incidents in that time. But I feel like maybe 10 years ago when I was making the film, I was more, I was looking back at that time. I'm thinking it's, it was an important time in Alberta's history and in Canada's history. And I wanted to tell a story that was that people didn't know, but they connected to an important event. Um, 
yeah uh let me think where i was going with that but in the 40 years that happened since i guess i i um looking at it now um it's the uh, community's approaches of being open to each other that i think is this important thing that i want to I just want to be out in the world that, that that there's a lot of different approaches and I think talking about it and being neighborly and sharing and you know having a picnic like it sounds almost like how did that work but of course that worked at the same time because it's yeah. just people identifying with each other on, on an individual basis and that's how I think you defeat these uh like ideas like stereotypes and racism I feel like the basketball game it's continuing the conversation it's helping a lot of kids understand what really happened because reading a news report isn't really going to help the, us understand what happened but a graphic yeah. novel definitely can and the point of view of of a kid i think really helps that's true yeah. um even though i think one of the craziest parts of the story is that i was that young mm -hmm. when it happened and i do kind of have um 12 and up in there although it's kind of 11 and up um also uh i feel like you do need to kind of be at a level to talk about it all because it is it is tough um yeah. there's a, a serious subject matter <laughs> um but, and i think having the conversations and being open to you know having adults that you trust and that you can talk to yeah. about these things is really important it is so important and since starting my podcast i've heard from several authors that they've been told their manuscripts or their books in general like they've been told that their books are too jewish by others in the book industry mm. and they needed to tone down the jewishness of their writing have you ever experienced this in your writing or film journey and if not has this happened to anyone that you know no um i mean it sounds like something more that I would think happened a long time ago. I know there were a lot of um, Jewish writers who would create these characters who were like, you know, essentially kind of a very Jewish thing about them, but but they weren't outwardly um, talking about being Jewish. So like, I don't know, I could give you a bunch of dated references, but um, um, we're talking about the Jewish experience without yeah. saying this is a Jewish character and I think uh, Clark Kent is probably my favorite example of that like Superman's alter ego um, I think that the, the two Jewish teenagers who created Superman were saying something when they created Clark Kent but um, anyways I think um, I have never been told anything like that I don't know how I would even react um, I feel like in writing and the reason why I love autobiographical writing so much is like, I want to feel like I'm in someone else's story. I want to see yeah. the world through someone else's eyes. And I think empathy is this like incredible, that's like everything I do. I'm trying to see it from that point of view. How can I build empathy with the reader or the audience if it's a film? And I, that's why I love making documentaries. And that's why I love autobiographical uh, graphic novels, because you're, getting a chance to see the world through someone's eyes. And and the, often the details, I think, that make us unique, that you include in your own personal story, that make it feel real, that's what people identify with, even if they're not Jewish. They're like, oh, that's, we have a thing like that. Or, oh, that's what that is. Or I've always wondered what, yeah. like I included Shabbat in, in there because mm -hmm. for me that, I remember that making me feel comfortable at camp. Like it's this universal thing, just like I do at home. Cool. And so I wanted that moment in there, but I think it's a way to share who we are. And I love when I get that sort of thing in, in stories. I'm pretty sure that you're the first filmmaker I've had on my podcast. And I know listeners and myself included would love to hear about your journey into filmmaking. Now, I know that comics really inspired you to start filmmaking, but I'm also just curious, once you started becoming a filmmaker, how did you find, like, roles in all these companies and organizations like Food Network, Discovery, that kind of stuff? Um, wow. Well, 
I guess I started with film, just with my friends making ridiculous uh, things to make each other laugh. And back then we were using VCRs to edit. So we'd have two of them wired together and play one and record on the other one. Uh, it was not simple. Um, and it means to act, sound really young, but what is yeah? But what is a VCR? I knew that as, as soon as I said it. I'm like, that's it's it's old. Um, they were tapes that we that you would okay. use. So that was how I started. Um, and then, like I was saying, with writing, it was getting on a computer and being able to cut and paste uh, that idea. Um, my mind. Um, it, it is very kind of non-linear and I'll be like hmm what if I have this idea and I put it here and then hey what else is over there and I was like it's kind of um, from having learning disabilities and ADHD it's just the way things work but cutting and pasting words for a story it was very much the same to do that with film as soon as it was on a computer I could move the pieces around and so I took to film editing very quickly and um it's something that I've done. I went to school and studied uh, creative writing, also studied animation, and I also studied um, communications. Uh, and that was a, my specialty was film. And so I've continued to do kind of all three things. And um, I love uh, editing and especially documentary editing because it's very much like writing. It doesn't start with a script. It's like a giant puzzle where people film hundreds of hours of, of material, of interviews, like we're doing. And then uh, it's my job to go in and figure out how do you turn this into a, a movie, a story that's just going to be, you know, 90 minutes long and use like less than 99.99% of all this stuff that I will throw in the garbage and just take, you know, the, the hour and a half that tells the story. So that sort of puzzle, um, I absolutely love. And so I've worked on all sorts of documentary related things, including, you know, food network, food stories, which some people have. I did a show about food trucks. That was really awesome. Um, and I love uh, telling stories that way and seeing the world through the, the eyes of someone who, you know, I've never met before, but now I kind of get look into their world. And so I love that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's the kind of thing, when I finished school, I started, that was when, um, it was right before YouTube had started, and I was making short films with my friends and sharing them online, and it was right at the start of all of that. And so that was kind of my way into just like making things and making connections, because people were seeing things I was making, and then it led to work on TV shows. First, it was a show about Cirque du Soleil behind the scenes. Um, and they had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Um, and someone had to figure out where, what, to, you know, where the story was. And so I've been doing that for about 20 years on different shows. Um, and every, each one is a totally different world and experience. So it's exciting. And in my time that I, outside of that, I try and tell my own stories. And so I've made the basketball game and shop class as two autobiographical animated films and now turned the basketball game into a book. Out of all the short films, videos, and TV shows you've been involved with, which project's been the most meaningful to you? Well, besides the basketball game. Wow, yeah, uh, that's tough because everything I make, you know, is like the thing I'm, slowly working on yeah. you know for usually for months so each and every single time I make something I'm like this is my favorite yeah, this one is the sense. best thing I've ever done and then I'll go on and do something else so it's tough but the ones that have really connected with audiences or being attached to some bigger thing in society are the ones that I um really care about so the basketball game and shop class because they're my own stories and because yeah. when they go out there's a, a this kind of built-in community that was there also and they love that I'm kind of bringing everybody back to that moment and sharing their own memories of it so those are really special and I've made um I've written a couple documentary features and edited that that are really uh 
important because they uh i don't know they get seen and it's fun to share uh yeah. the creative stuff you do yeah but i can name them or i'll i'll feel bad what are you currently working on are you working on any short films maybe some sh shows for tv shows or maybe another graphic novel what are you working on at the moment that we can look forward to i am well i'm always working on a film um the one right now is about grizzly bears Ooh. it's about grizzly bears being rewilded so Ooh, unfortunately the cubs if the mother passes away and the cubs aren't old enough to take care of themselves um they're not gonna survive very long so there's it's a story about a, a grizzly a bear center in in northern bc where they um try and raise them until they're old enough to be put into the woods rewilded so it's an interesting story that does yeah. sound really interesting i want to watch that um yeah and i'm usually uh the, like I've, i don't know i did a one about a band before that a famous uh vancouver band and this great story behind them um i've done i get to work on so many different cool uh areas where it's like i didn't know anything about it before and by the six months later i'm going to know everything about it and hopefully be able to tell the story to somebody else in an hour and a half if you could be or meet any literary character fictional or real who would it be and why wow Ooh. i thought about this uh i've thought about this before because i love comics so much yeah but i'm always like where would my place be in this universe like if I'm hanging out with Spider-Man who I love what's gonna happen because I've read all the Spider-Man team-ups and it's usually like you get attacked by a super villain and I don't do well in those situations so I don't know if that's the right the really if I think about it where I want to put myself in this scenario maybe you can meet Peter Parker so, so that's the thing it's more like a Peter Parker like uh background character at the Daily Bugle or <laughs> For a while, Superman worked uh, instead of at a newspaper, it was at a TV news. Like I could be the editor there and <laughs> I could I could be the one who discovers, hey, take off the glasses. He looks just like Superman. Um, so I think I could fit in somehow, maybe if I was like in the secret identity part. But, but fictional character of all time, if I'm truly honest like deep deep down it's probably Clifford the big red dog who yes. I have always loved I love dogs and if I could hang out with a giant dog I think I'm done that's I don't really no no one else would come close and thank you so much for joining me today heart for sure from Thanks the heart so from the bottom of my heart yeah. um I think that people have told you that pun quite a bit I've heard I've heard a lot of puns I cheer for heart puns when I, when I hear them <laughs> Because I, I mean, then I know I'm not alone. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful you shared your story with the world and were able to share your journey with me today. The basketball game is so important, everybody. It's hard to believe that people are still spreading such lies and prejudices all around the world, even in this day and age. But it's so comforting to know that there are ways that we can tackle these problems, that we can make a difference and don't not spread hate, but spread love. Make love, not hate. as the great John Lennon and other people said in the 1970s. Um, so anyway, I hope the basketball game gets into the hands of teachers, librarians, and students so the important lessons shared in your story can inspire others to remember to be kind and accept everyone who's different and spread the truth. Because teachers, they're supposed to tell the truth because they're not really teachers if they can't really teach the truth. And... I hope you all enjoy hearing about Hart Snyder's writing journey, filmmaking journey, other other journeys. He has a lot of journeys. And just thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today, Hart. And I'll see you in the next one, everyone. <laughs>